Good morning. I'm Matt Driscoll, editor of Asian Aviation Magazine and AsianAviation.com. Welcome to the latest in conversation sponsored by Metrojet of Hong Kong. Today we are speaking, take two this time, with Sumesh Patel. He's the president for Asia Pacific of CETA. Sumesh, welcome back. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Matt. Uh, good to see you. Good to see you too. Um, as I mentioned before we started recording, it's 2024. It's the end of the second quarter now. Uh, there's no shut borders except maybe Russia and Ukraine and things like that. Airlines are roaring back. We just had the IATA AGM uh, in Dubai. Uh, they came out with uh, new figures. Uh, airlines look to be really profitable this year. Uh, give us a, sort of your overview of the industry from where you're sitting at CETA. So as you rightly said, Matt, uh, this is a really exciting time uh, for our industry, especially in the ATI. And, uh, you know, uh, IATA did say that the air traffic is uh, back on track and they are expecting about uh, 4.7 billion uh, people to travel in 2024, which is surprisingly breaking even the pre-pandemic record. And, you know, because earlier people were saying that we will just recover by 2024, but now, uh, you know, they're forecasting that uh, 2024, it will break uh, pre-pandemic record. So it's clearly a really an exciting times. Um, and, and if you look at, you know, what uh, the industry is really focusing on, I would say maybe, uh, you know, three areas. One, uh, you know, digital transformation uh, to help them basically in terms of the operational efficiencies, uh, you know, friction, uh, frictionless and the full biometric journey experience. Uh, and that's not only airport, but extending to airport and borders. The second one I would say more important is sustainability. Uh, you know, and, and what we are really working very closely uh, with the airlines, airports, basically to help them track, report and uh, optimize uh, the energy and fuel consumption emissions uh, and, uh, you know, helping their journey towards a net zero future. And especially through operational data, AI, uh, flight optimization services. So this is, this is the second area. And the third, uh, you know, which we are focusing on is also in terms of uh, the new emerging technologies, uh, which includes uh, urban air, mobility, uh, turnaround optimization, baggage, which is one of the key areas, and of course, much more. And there are two, you know, uh, areas where uh, we have made some recent announcement and I would like to, you know, touch Upon. One is, of course, you know, we are working with, uh, uh, you know, the Singapore uh, University of Technology and Design, uh, SUTD, basically to create an off-site passenger processing solution that would, uh, you know, provide airline passengers with, with a complete fresh experience uh, for checking in themselves uh, and their baggage, uh, almost any location, like at the hotel or everywhere. So, you know, we, we are working with them to put a, a proof of concept together using uh, our technology. So that will change, uh, you know, the landscape completely in terms of uh, uh, passenger experience and travel. And the other area where, you know, we are focusing is also maritime. So we have launched uh, a new company called SmartSea uh, with a partnership with uh, Columbia Ship Management, CSM. And what we are trying to do is that CSM brings their expertise in maritime and we bring our expertise in technology. So how can we extend uh, the same experience, what, uh, you know, the passenger experience at the airport also for the maritime industry? And then, you know, and one of the reason is because maritime is said to have almost 10 to 15 years behind in terms of technology versus air transfer industry. So we're trying to bring that at par. To, for the passengers to have a complete seamless end-to-end -end, uh, travel experience. Okay, a lot to discuss. Uh, let's start with automation. Uh, this is one of my favorite things to talk about, and, and I, I tend to hammer it a little bit, uh, just because my experience has not been good. Uh, flying out of Singapore, uh, I think it was T2, um, one time it was on Emirates, one time it was on Singapore Airlines, and my wife, just traveled uh, as well to Singapore and back uh, here to Cambodia, and she had trouble with it. it it's the, the self check-in thing. And both times that I've had to use it, I've had to, I ran into problems. Either it didn't, uh, it had a conflict with my passport and the booking name uh, because one has my middle name in it, the other one didn't. 
Uh, then also it, it wouldn't, both times the bag tags were not recognized or were not processed properly. So each time I had to, I got kicked out of the, autom the automated line and had to go get a human to check me in. And it went through, you know, after I waited in line for 45 minutes, it took three minutes for me to check in. I know, and I'm cynical because I think the automation is a way to cut jobs. And, and that's sort of where I see things. Uh, and again, my wife had problems as well. So I know people are pushing the, the self check-in, Seated is pushing it, airlines are pushing it, they like it, uh, but sometimes it just doesn't work. How do you solve those problems? But I, I think Matt, uh, you know, I'm uh, sorry that you had a really unfortunate experience, but I, I, I can tell you that, you know, um, the technology is not just to help cut costs, uh, but also to help and process the passenger much faster to basically give a you know better experience. And uh, you know, if I just look at the number and then I'll come back to you know what we can do in terms of the question. So you know, if you look at the numbers, if today uh, you know our, our, our smart pot kiosk has been implemented in over 130 airports, so the, clearly they they are the way to go, and then they help to solve a lot of uh, congestion and uh, you know a lot of issues at the airport. And you know, one one such airport whom we work with, in fact. They, they uh, you know, publicly announced that and they, it's, a, it's a decent sized airport which processes about 50 million passengers and they have about 40 airlines and ground handlers. And they did say that, you know, by taking the advantage of uh, the latest sales service technology, uh, they were able to create fast and efficient uh, check-in process and which increased the passenger uh, processing capacity by almost 25%. So, you know, clearly the technology is certainly helping. Now, coming back to the experience you had, you know, what, what, one thing is, of course, the name, uh, which is very critical, and we need to make sure that, you know, it is exactly the same what is in the passport, because uh, otherwise, uh, you know, the, the, I've seen some cases where they don't allow even passengers to, to fly if the, the name is not exactly matching. But to address this problem, you know, what we are currently doing is we are working on uh, digital travel credential which basically helps uh, to have a digital identity also. So in addition to your passport, you have your digital identity. What it does is that, you know, exactly the same problem. The many of the reasons the time why people can't use uh, the kiosk is because of the DocuCheck. So there are documents which are required to be checked in terms of maybe visa, the other you know documents and the travel documents, and and those needs to be physically validated. And and what we are trying to build is to have a, a digital identity or a digital travel credential which holds all your data, which is not just your passport data, but also your visa, your frequent flyer, everything. So basically that will help you to then validate yourself with your face rather than even looking at the documents. So you will be able to then enjoy the touch points even better. So today there is no standardization, but clearly uh, IKO is working on that and we are part of that committee to help uh, with having a standard uh, DTC, with digital travel credential, which will help to you know facilitate this much better and smoother in, 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 in I would say coming days or months. The digital ID sounds interesting, and we were talking about that. Uh, we'll talk about that some more. I, it reminds me of the movie, and, and I like movies, so we have a couple of movie references here. I forget the name of the movie, actually, with Bruce Willis, but uh, it's really an interesting movie. And they have the multi-pass in there where it's your driver's license, it, it gets you on an airplane or a spaceship or whatever. Uh, and it's the multi-pass, so I'm, I'm sure we'll probably see something like that. But also another movie reference here, Minority Report with Tom Cruise, where he had his eyes swapped out because when you walk into a, a subway train or you walk into a store or something, it, it scans your retinas uh, and every, it knows who you are and your sales history and this and that. Uh, so you mentioned biometrics earlier. Uh, I know we're not going to see that anytime soon, but but talk to us a little bit about biometrics and, and what that's going to do uh, for the traveler, for the air passenger. Well, uh, you know, biometrics will not only transform the airport experience for the passenger, but complete end-to-end -end journey. So, you know, I, I did mention that, you know, Smart C, we're working with Meditime too. So, you know, just imagine that if you are traveling uh, you know, from, uh, you know, A to B, and you're taking maybe a cruise from there or taking a train and, and you know, uh, and, and then, of course, going to the hotel and, and checking in. 
And you and imagine you don't have to use your physical documents at any of those touch points, and you have a smooth journey, and you know you can use your face as uh, you know identity at every step of your journey, and that will transform and change your complete experience. And that could be even you know when you do a backdrop, every step of the journey. So and and biometrics, uh, you know, basically what we see is is it is going to be real because you know one of uh, the IT insight which we did recently, and where you know where we spoke to almost about 140 airline and airports and uh, you know their feedback was that by 2026 uh, 50% of the airports they plan to implement um, a biometrics a check in and backdrop and uh, not only on the airports but 70% of the airlines are expecting to have uh, biometric id management in place so clearly you know we are seeing that all airlines and airports are embarking on this technology. And of course, we are then working with immigration also, because it's not just good enough that you have your biometrics when you check in and board the aircraft, but you should have the similar experience even when you're going through the immigration in the country where you're departing, and also having the same biometric experience and walkthrough experience at the country where you're arriving. So, you know, the biometric will certainly make that uh, possible and, and make the journey much more enjoyable. Let's talk about, uh, I think we talked before, you CJ had made an investment in a company called, is it Indicio, uh, which does just that, a decentralized ID technology. Uh, and what you were just talking about, an airline uh, digital ID. Uh, does CETA, are you going to be making more investments along those lines? Uh, I, th I seem to remember a press release that came out in the last few weeks. Uh, where you were partnering with another company. What, what are CETA's plans in this area? So clearly, you know, um, at CETA, we are uh, committed to accelerating the, you know, digitalization of the air transit industry. And uh, this can only uh, be possible uh, working closely with the airline, airports, governments, and all the industry bodies. Uh, and, and, you know, our... our uh, Trust, you know, what we have done is that uh, our investment in Indicio, uh, they are the global market leader in uh, decentralized uh, identity technology. So through this uh, uh, trust network, uh, CETA and Indicio, uh, we have uniquely uh, enabled the addition of travel documents, as I was mentioning earlier. So basically your visa, boarding passes, frequent flyer, to the passenger digital identity. So, you know, uh, now as a traveler, you can control your personal data, where, at what touch point you want to share what data. And, uh, you know, uh, it basically, through this uh, trust network, uh, the, the passenger can then choose that not just for say uh, you know your air travel where do you want to share these uh, 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 you know your digital identity at what your touch points and you know uh, from our perspective our digital travel work with Indicio uh, which we have also done with Aruba so we have certainly a test case where we have implemented this technology so a passenger traveling to Aruba can do their digital travel credential even before they arrive uh, into the island and and then when they arrive, then they have a walkthrough experience and not just at the airport, at the same digital identity they can use at uh, multiple other places. So they, if they go to restaurants, they go to club, they can similarly use the same digital identity. So it's also going even beyond just on your travel uh, or, or just on the air travel. Okay, so Mesh, uh, I want to follow up with a couple of things on that, but right now we need to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor, MetroJet of Hong Kong. We'll be right back after this. Yeah. We're going to have the crown jewels of Asia, and I promise you we're going to have the nicest and, and busiest business aviation hangar in the region.
And we're back. We are talking to Samesh Patel. He's president for Asia Pacific at CETA. Samesh, before the break, uh, we were talking about your investment in Indicio, biometrics, different things like that. And I, I forgot to ask, one thing that I'm very interested in is standards. Uh, when we talk about digital IDs and all of this, we saw during the pandemic, and I, I thought I would never have to talk about the pandemic again, but I guess I do. Uh, but during the pandemic, we had all these health passes come out. IATA had a health pass. IBM came out with one. Uh, everybody and their dog uh, basically came up with a health pass. None of them could agree on standards. Governments couldn't agree on standards. Governments couldn't agree on standards for uh, how many COVID shots you needed to have, whether it was one or two. Or most decided it was at least two. Some said three, so on and so forth. So with things like digital IDs that, and, and I don't really understand why it's so difficult because we have standards for passports. Every passport has certain security functions. It has certain information that's required, you know, date of birth, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and there's all kinds of built-in security features in, in all the passports where whether I'm in an airport in Dubai or whether I'm in an airport in Paris or whatever, when they scan it, up comes the information. Why, how can we get on digital IDs and things like that and biometrics, so on and so forth, where are the standards going to come in and how do we get uh, countries to agree to these standards? So I think, I think Matt, that, that's a very good question. You know, uh, one of the challenge, and I would say the reason why we had that uh, those issues is because you know, no one was expecting it. No one had worked on uh, these issues ever. So every government, every country came up with their own ways of looking at things and, you know, how they and they close the border and they said, these are my restrictions and this is the way I would want someone coming to my country to comply to one, two, three, four, five. Uh, learning from that, uh, and, and you know, uh, uh, we had done that even this in past. So, for example, uh, we had put in a, a common check-in system. We were the pioneer who invented this uh, for the Olympics in the U.S. in the 80s, right? So clearly, there is a technology available. Well, during pandemic, also, what we did was, um, and it, it, since it was really hard to have the standards because. You know, to have so many countries and having their own ways of looking at things was very difficult. What we did was to help the industry to build a standard platform, which would help interoperability of various different health passes. So irrespective of the country, irrespective of the health pass, how can we digitally validate those and have those interoperate? So for you, for example, as a passenger, if you... Uh, you know, when you're going to the airport and during the pandemic, and we don't want to talk about it, it's already history. But if, if, if we look at it, you know, when you travel during those days, you didn't know that you had everything what you needed to even board the flight because, you know, they were checking everything what the, the destination country needed and, and the passenger anxiety was really high. And that's where we helped to build, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a platform which would help interoperate all of these health passes. So for you, you know, if it's validated through the app, as a passenger, you you are, you know, much more confident and, you know, much more relaxed to say that I have everything what I need to fly to that airport. Now, going back to, uh, you know, the standards uh, in terms of digital ID, now when we move to the next phase, which is on uh, uh, digital ID, and biometrics, it is very important that there are standards in place. And that is the reason why uh, IKO has taken the lead and they are working with the entire uh, industry. And we are part of that committee to help develop DTC standards. So you have the basic standards on digital travel credentials and there those will be applicable globally. And maybe you, you never know that, you know, if these standards uh, mature enough, then, you know, five years, 10 years down the line, you may not even need a physical passport because all your requirement or what you all, whatever you need is in your digital identification. And maybe passport is just as a backup if something goes wrong on your mobile or your battery is out and you don't have all the details you need. And then as a backup, you have your passport. But maybe in future, uh, you know, the digital ID may replace passports. Interesting. Uh, we talked about this before with all the hackers out there and, and, and everything that's going on. I mean, uh, you know, I remember the days when when I was growing up, they would deliver a phone book to the house and it had your address, your name, your phone number, your zip code, 
all this information uh, so everybody knew where you were. I mean, you could opt out of being listed. Uh, and Google and Facebook, they probably know more about me than, than my wife does or my parents or, or whatever. Uh, but do people have valid concerns that their, their information, if we go to this digital ID and things like that, uh, is their information safe? I'd say uh, with the digital way to go, it will be uh, even more uh, safer. Uh, and, and digitalization, you know, uh, if, if I look at, you know, if I recall when we had this interview almost a year back, uh, you know, now, now you have a background, but that time you didn't, and I had an opportunity to peep into your office, and certainly your setup uh, also looked like a spaceship, right? So, so everyone is uh, dealing with the technology, and, uh, you know, you know, I would say I'm amazed that to see that not just us, but even uh, boomers and our parents, they've adapted technology. Uh, forget Gen Z and millennials, uh, for them, it, it comes naturally. And, uh, you know, we, and, we, and, and if you look at technology, we are doing that for our day to day life already. Right. So be it banking, ordering food, doing everything. We, everything is digital. And everything is online these days. And it, it, it's just a matter of time when the aviation will shift heavily onto uh, digital technologies also. But in terms of, uh, you know, security, uh, you know, that that comes by design. So today, if you see most of the solutions which we design, they are by design in terms of taking security and, and data protection into consideration. And that is becoming more and more difficult because there are uh, regulations in various different countries. So everyone who would come up with those solutions will need to follow those standards. So, uh, you know, in, in future, and, and again, uh, you know, everyone says that uh, uh, <laughs> These incidents will happen, but how can you contain them better and how can you fix them as, as fast as possible? That would be very key uh, because it, the hackers are not going to go away. Uh, whatever kind of system people put in place, we hear that for banks, we hear for every every possible solution. But, you know, it doesn't mean that when we were writing checks that time there were no no frauds. They were frauds too. So, so it will continue, but you know, how can we continue to build the system much stronger, having these basic, uh, you know, the charters into your place in terms of how we build our product and solutions and follow the regulations for each of those country will make sure that we are safer and, you know, this, we can rely on the solution more and more. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, you mentioned my office. I've got, I'm, you know, you, you can't see it now, but I've got three screens I'm looking at. I've got video cameras. I've got an iPad. I've got an iPhone. I've got a laptop somewhere around here. Uh, the funny thing is my father, who, bless his heart, he's, he's 88, 89 years old now. He's never sent an email in his life. Uh, and we got him an iPhone a long time ago, and he's he has figured out how to use WhatsApp. Uh, but he still has problem turning the camera on and things like that. So, uh, you know, I grew up a lot differently uh, uh, than he did. Uh, Sumesh, we're running out of time and, and uh, all of that. So I want to ask you kind of get the crystal ball out and look and what do you see happening uh, sort of in the traveling, the air travel world for the next six months, the next year, the next two years? Um, I would say, you know, I wish I had a crystal ball, but but you know, where I can see uh, where where the focus is going to be is clearly, as I mentioned earlier, is in terms of uh, digital transformation and digital shift. Uh, the focus area is going to be on the net zero target of uh, 2050. Uh, SFA certainly helps, uh, but that's a few years away. Uh, but what can, how can technology help uh, uh, in terms of achieving the net zero target in the meantime? And um, of course, uh, you you know, uh, digitalization processes, embracing digital identities and biometrics, uh, what we see from CDA perspective would be key focus. And of course, finally, I would say the intermodal where you can have your digital identity as your digital travel credential, which uh, as, as an individual and a traveler, we can use at every step of the journey and not just for the air travel, but every step of your journey. And that that is what we see that's going to be coming uh, as more real and in the near future. Okay, Sumesh Patel, President, Asia Pacific for CETA. Thanks for joining me in conversation. Thanks, man. Pleasure speaking with you.